Hello there everybody, what culture wrestling's Adam Cleary here and sometimes, sometimes a wrestler has absolutely everything except for the ability to talk. You can be the best technical wrestler in the world, you can have the body of a Greek god if you have a silly helium voice or you come out with the same kind of patter as some kind of drunk Love Island contestant, nobody's gonna pay money to watch you. And that's where the humble manager comes in, isn't it? Someone designed to mask a wrestler's greatest weakness while of course maintaining the thin conceit that it is indeed a sport. Brock Lesnar! for example, is a great example. He is received as a superhuman monster, mostly because when Paul Heyman talks, it scares you shitless. Now, I just want you to imagine for one second if Brock Lesnar was managed not by Paul Heyman, but by Adam Wilborn. Are you still scared of him? Of course you're not. And that's because, of course, very obviously that is not a particularly good pairing. And yet sometimes over the years, WWE have looked at significantly worse pairings than the Beast and the Bean pull through there and decided to run with it. So with that in mind, my name is Adam Cleary and these are 10 amazing WWE wrestlers given terrible managers. Number 10, Steve Austin. Vivacious Veronica. Yep, as you're gonna learn in this video, Steve Austin does not have a good record when it comes to managers. Upon his debut in WCW around 1991, Austin's first arm-linked valet down to the ring was not as is commonly misremembered his wife Jeannie Clark, but it was a relative unknown named Veronica. Now, rumors have persisted for years since that she was little more than just some random valet who some Turner executive madly in love with her had gifted the spot to in an attempt to presumably do the thing, but no, she was actually a product of New Jersey's Monster Factory, the same place that gave us Bam Bam Bigelow, Matt Riddle, and Sheamus. She arrived in WCW from the Pacific Northwest Territory after Dusty Rhodes had given her the name Vivacious Veronica, but it just really didn't work out, and they booted her after a couple of weeks and put Austin's wife in instead. Number nine, Mr. Perfect, coach. Never really understood this growing up, but if Mr. Perfect was so perfect, then why did he need a manager? I mean, fair enough, they did initially put him with tactician par excellence Bobby Heenan, and that kind of seemed to work as a pairing, but after he segued to commentary duties, they put him with somebody else who was not as good. John Tolos was a respected veteran throughout the industry. Everybody thought he was a great guy. He'd worked with Killer Kowalski and Gorilla Monsoon, but... As the coach, what did he do? He did a lot of whistling, and that was it. Yes, the classic trope of a sports motivator did absolutely nothing for Mr. Perfect, who could already cut a better promo than his alleged manager, and in the end just ended up getting in loads of hijinks in the ring. Bad, 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 bad. Number eight, Shawn Michaels, Jose Lothario. Now, when Shawn Michaels realized his boyhood dream and he won his first WWF championship, he told referee Earl Hebner to get that piece of shit out of the ring. And the assumption has always been over the years that he was referring to Bret Hart, but when you find out what contempt he held his manager in, he might have been talking about him as well. Now you gotta remember, back in the mid-90s, Michaels was being groomed as this big new star in WWE, and no matter how hot under the collar or slightly moist in the trousers McMahon got when he looked at him, didn't quite think he was sympathetic enough to the audience. So what did he do? He gave him a 61-year-old manager, Jose Lothario, and just made this complete mess of Michael's entire gimmick of being the face of the new generation. Because it's a new generation, and the man's 60, you see that, it doesn't work. Michael's apparently really, really resented this intrusion on his career, and like, it's not for me to say that's because the 61-year-old didn't want to go out with the boys and party quite as hearty as Sean was doing at the time, but I am thinking that extremely loudly. I mean, yeah, for a match or two, it might have made sense in some kind of story, but it persisted for a while, and then WrestleMania, and then for a while longer than that, and at no stage did it work. Number seven, the Four Horsemen, Hiro Matsuda. Yes, Big Hero 6 he has a number of claims to fame in the world of professional wrestling. Not only did he try such legends as Ron Simmons, Scott Hall, and the Great Muta, but he also had another student whose leg he broke, Hulk Hogan. One thing he probably isn't going to be remembered for is his brief stewardship as the manager of the Four Horsemen. He took a little, there was a weird gap in the middle when J.J. Dillon was doing it, he just went in the middle. They did this sole story that Dillon had apparently sold his shares in the Four Horsemen to the Yamazaki Corporation, and then they just thrust Hero 
in there as the manager with no real explanation. He did the square root of precisely very little during that role, then eventually got shifted out to Terry Fogg's promotion sometime after that. If you do remember him though, if you do recognize that face, he was the man who was like the interpreter, introducer for all the Japanese wrestlers in WCW. Number six, Steve Austin, Colonel Robert Parker. Yes, from one stable to another now, when Steve Austin was part of the Dangerous Alliance group, in WCW. Remember, he had that really tight hold on the old television championship under the stewardship of Paul Heyman, I might add. He had yet more managerial mishaps. I mean, I say that to first get they had to become part of the Hollywood Blondes with Brian Pillman, but then his eye went to wandering, and when his partner got injured, he moved in with Colonel Robert Parker. Now, in fairness, the guy wasn't actually that bad, but they just put him with Steve Austin, a man who could cut a promo 10 times better than his alleged manager ever could. The guy was absolutely sensational on the mic, just WCW couldn't see it. And it wasn't the only thing they couldn't see because in 1995, Austin gave Bischoff his trademark double birdie and departed for the WWF. Now, history escapes me here, but I think he was relatively successful after that. Apparently, story goes that when he left, Parker actually talked to him and said, you're making a mistake, Steve, old buddy. You don't want to go there. Oops. Number five, The Undertaker, Brother Love. Now, you might think if you've got a reanimated zombie gimmick in one hand and a real life mortician in the other, common sense would be to put these two together. But no, 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 no. WWE did not originally want to put The Undertaker with Paul Bearer, despite how very obviously that is obvious. And as anyone who listens to his podcast or just is up on their WWE history will know, it was actually Bruce Pritchard's big red faced Brother Love character who introduced Mean Mark to the audience. I can't think for the life of me though, why that didn't work. I mean, just looking at it, such a natural fit. And the story goes, it wasn't even that management took one look at that picture and went, ah, oh, God, we've made a mistake here. It was just that Pritchard was gonna have to leave his production role and go full time on the road if he wanted this to be a regular gig. And he didn't fancy it, so he turned it down. So they had to look around and go, gee whiz, the dead guy. Who, the de who can we put with the dead guy? No, 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 not the mortician. Number four, Steve Austin, Ted DiBiase. So the last, last Austin on this, promise. Yes, just a few weeks into his WWE run, Steve Austin was once again lumbered with a managerial mouthpiece he simply did not need. Did nobody hear this man talk? To be fair, that's probably what happened. McMahon must not have seen his ECW promos in which he took aim at his former employers in WCW. Because if he had, he wouldn't have thought he was going to be this random mid-card workhorse he couldn't give a live mic to. And the thing is, right, this is probably one of the biggest sliding doors moments in professional wrestling because WWE put Austin with Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man, and no matter how much Austin didn't need it, didn't like it, or didn't want it, they were convinced that was the way to go. But a year later, DiBiase left and they gave in to Austin's demands for something different. Look what happened. Number three, the Hardy Boys, Michael Hayes. All right, so picture it. In 1999, you've got this hot, young, emerging tag team. They're over with the lads. They're over with the ladies. They've got this greasy hair and these trendy baggy clothes and they're daredevils and you put them with Michael Hayes. And the thing is, had this come along 10 years earlier and Hayes hadn't been through that whole weird Dox Hendrix thing, then it might have worked, but that's, no, none of that is true. It came along when it did, and they squeezed 40 plus year old Hayes into a load of skin tight clothes. And I mean, I guess there's a nice little vibe there of, oh, isn't it nice your dad's gonna come down and watch you play football, any chance he can borrow one of your tops to show his support, but it just, no, it didn't work. Not long after he was set free from this duty and the Hardy Boys got an even weirder manager. Terry Runnels, but that one was at least funny. Number two, Dusty Rhodes, Sapphire. There was only one reason why Dusty Rhodes was forced to dance and jive alongside a manager far below his level, and it was the exact same reason that forced him into those polka dots. Spite. Now, all right, the extent to which he was humiliated by the company does maybe get slightly overplayed. Yes, he looked a bit silly, but they still booked him as a serious contender against like DiBiase, Macho Man, whoever you care to name. But if he needed a more youthful aesthetic to help him connect with the audience, then the addition of common woman Sapphire didn't work. And the thing is, Dusty knew it was never going to work and even insisted at one stage that they fire her. But they didn't, they persisted. And over time, he softened on his opinion as she developed into the role. Apparently things got so good by the end between the pair of them that she even broke down in tears when she heard she would be leaving his side. But regardless of how cozy the friendship got, the actual managerial connection never did. I'll just put it this way, right? By the end, Dusty would have been sad to see her go, but he would categorically have not asked for a receipt. Number one, 
Daniel Bryan, The Miz. Yeah, here's one slightly out of left field. When Daniel Bryan's path crossed with The Miz in 2010, it felt to anybody with even a jot of common sense or a single shred of understanding about the wrestling industry, it felt to all of us that the world had been flipped completely upside down. All right, so on one side of this, you have a man who's worked his ass off for over 10 years, performing at shows and venues all around the world, earning championships, critical acclaim, match of the year nominations, all in his stride. Comfortably one of the best pro wrestlers on the entire planet. And on the other side, you've got a former reality TV star who has managed to bluff his way into a prominent position in WWE. Now, it does make sense that one of these men would manage the other, but WWE just got them mixed up. The idea that Daniel Bryan would be presented as the Miz's rookie on NXT, which let's not forget back in those days was little more than a glorified game show, felt like it was specifically designed to annoy independent wrestling fans. And when you think about it, it probably was. And you know what it is? The irony of this mismatch has actually informed a lot of what their best work has been in WWE. It was the basis of that Talking Smack promo. It was the basis of their 2018 rivalry. And even more ironically, Miz is actually now the experienced, tenured veteran he just pretended to be back then. It's a funny old game. So there you have it. Those are 10 amazing wrestlers with terrible managers. Read to you by a man who, in case you hadn't realised, hasn't been managed a day in his life for... Well, too long, let's just say. Let me know what you made of it all in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. I have, of course, been Adam Cleary. I really do want to be someone's manager at some point in wrestling. I'll get to work on that. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Hi, guys. I'm Adam Wilborner from What Culture here to let you know we want your live event videos, whether that be something that happened after the cameras stopped rolling or your reaction to something amazing that went down at the show you were at. Stuff like this. One of the other sweetest things I've ever seen was just recently when we saw Roman Reigns kick the sh** out of cancer and come back on Monday Night Raw. So make sure you send them to us in all the usual ways. You can tweet them at us, you can send them to us on Facebook, you can email them to us. Hell, if it's your sort of thing, you can stick them on a memory stick and post them to What Culture. But the one thing you need to remember is good, bad. Thanks for watching. Bye.